Good morning. We're going to have to holler louder and hear Good people. Morning. Hey, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> Scripture reading this morning is First Pe one Peter three fourteen to fifteen. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your heart reveal Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So be it. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it has stood the test of time. Even though many people have tried to stamp out your word, there is no way your word endures forever, and we thank you for it. We thank you for the availability that we have to just pick it up and read it wherever we're at in so many different translations and, and commentaries and everything else. Lord, we thank you for the spirit that indwells us and reveals your word. Guide us into all truth as we seek you out, that you will be found, that you're not far from us. Help us to find you, Lord, so that we may be a holy set-apart people like Christ in this world to make a difference. So that when we do get the opportunity to tell of our hope that we have, that we can confidently tell others the hope that we have regardless of our situations, that we know that we are your child and will be forever with you when we pass from this life. We just thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I entitled this, It's Good to Have a Lifeboat. And it is good to have a lifeboat. Sometimes our lifeboat, though, is not necessarily what we think it is. There's a little white car out there in the driveway. That's not a motorhome. That wasn't my lifeboat either. God was my lifeboat. Next week, we're going to be taking the kids to, uh, well, starting this week, to uh, one last summer vacation. And Walt's going to be preaching, good Lord willing. And he's got something to tell you about a trip. But I'll tell you about my trip today. But we're going to talk about Jonah's trip and Paul's trip also. Because sometimes you face troubles at sea, don't you? I mean, everything's not smooth sailing all the time. We like for it to be, but it's not. I'm sure all of you have stories you could tell like that. It's familiar to all of us. When you think of troubles at sea, do you think of Jonah? Do you think of Paul? Luke writes one of the most detailed accounts of a shipwreck there is in the, in the uh, uh, book of Acts. Things don't always go as we plan. Sometimes they go much, much worse. There are difficulties in this world. There are struggles. There are things that test our faith. But isn't it good to know that you're not alone? Jesus said He would never forsake you. Isn't it good to know that God will not let one hair on your head be harmed outside of His will? Isn't it good to know that when you pass from death, you pass into eternal life in God's presence? Wow. If we could just think about that every time the troubles at sea happened, right? Because that's the problem when we stop losing focus of that and we get discouraged. But Paul is a great example. We've seen that already through the book of Acts, and I want to continue with that. God can save His people. God will save His people. It just may not be exactly the way that you think things will go. Remember that. Do you remember your calling? You were called. You were set apart. You were made holy. That's why you're supposed to revere God in your hearts, to set Him apart, to make Him holy by the way that you live and by the things that you say, so that people will know that you are God's people, that you're different from this world. There are good people in this world. There are bad people in this world. There are Christians in this world that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and there are others who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ but do not know Him. And there are many of those, Jesus says. He says on that day many will cry out, Lord, Lord, but He'll say, depart from me, I do not know you. 
Is your faith growing? Do you remember your calling? Are you living out your call? First thing you have to do is answer Jesus' call. And when Jesus calls a man, as uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer says, he calls him to die, to deny everything about himself, to take up your cross, whatever that may be, and follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ who with joy set out for the cross. Jesus' calling to you was to become a fisher of men. It wasn't just for Peter. It wasn't for, for James. It wasn't Paul's calling. It was your calling. It is your calling. Nothing has changed. Every step that you take, every day that you have, every breath that you take is God's grace upon you to tell His story so that when someone does see the difference in your life, they'll ask you and you can give it a witness and account for the hope that you have. Mark 1, verses 16 through 18, they, the peop, uh, the, they fish for a living. He's talking about uh, Peter and them. Jesus called out to them, Come follow after me, and I will show you how to fish for people. These are from the NLT because that's what I had on my journey, the easiest I could copy and paste Scripture. <laughs> it's dute o piso mu, which means to leave everything else behind, forsake it all, and come follow after Jesus, and He will make you into a fisher of men. You know, that's something I have to remember all the time because I try to do everything myself. It's, I try to be in my power, but it's totally out of my control. It was out of my control making it back here without being in a rental car. It was out of my control making it in a rental car because that's not my lifeboat. My lifeboat is Jesus Christ no matter where I'm at, no matter what circumstance I am. And my life is His alone to proclaim His glory and to give Him praises and honor, regardless of the troubles at sea we have, even the shipwrecks that we have. They fish for a living. You have to work for a living. There's things you have to do, but don't forget that your mission in this world, you were bought with a price, and your mission is to be a light to this world that others may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Won't God take care of you? Not only your needs. I mean, we try to work so hard and do things because we try to provide for ourselves. But when Jesus taught the disciple, to taught the crowds to, to pray, He said to pray for daily bread, to have faith for what we have. Well, let me read it to you. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. I have the New Living Translation. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. By the way I talk, by the way I live, if I am your child. May your kingdom come soon. I'm supposed to help usher that kingdom in, to be a child of the kingdom of heaven. May your will be done on earth, not mine, as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now you may or may not agree with me, but lack of faith can easily be a sin because God has told you to trust in Him and not worry about the things of this world. And don't let, let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Because you get tempted on that journey when you're in those tall seas to ha lose your faith, to complain, to mumble and groan, say, why, Lord, is this happening to me? When you don't understand what He's doing in your life, and He has a will and a purpose... And His purpose is that all men come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we are His ambassadors in this world. I hope this is your prayer. I hope you just don't recite it and, and don't take the words to heart. I've never had to live off of daily bread. I've always had something. So I always struggle there. Do I have the faith to, that I need to, to live off of daily bread? Because we are blessed so much. But there are many in this world that are Christians that aren't blessed, that suffer and die for, their, for the cause of Jesus Christ, for His name, just like they were in the days of the first church. Jesus goes on to say this in verse 30 through 34, Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Instead, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And we all have those troubles. We all have to walk by faith rather than sight. There's usually not a burning bush or even a compelling part of the Spirit of what to go. But if you take God's Word and you meditate on His Word, you know what to do. You know not to grumble. You know to trust God. You know to look for an opportunity to witness. 
Are you doing that? Our devotions this week discussed Jonah and his little trip at sea, right? What did he do? God called him. He went the wrong direction, didn't he? <laughs> Let me highlight it to you. God told him to fish for men, right? Way back many years before Jesus said that. But his heart wasn't on the men that he was fishing for because he didn't want those scoundrels in Nineveh to be saved. He wanted to withhold the keys to the kingdom of heaven from them. Why in the world would you want to cast judgment or blame on somebody else when you were an enemy of Christ, nailing the nails into his hands and feet? He died for such a sinner as you and I, no matter how righteous we think that we are. He set out to sail in his own direction rather than God's direction, and a storm came. There's no account in that story of a lifeboat. Did you know that? And you know God told him or supplied him a lifeboat. There is a story or an account of a lifeboat in Acts if you read that, but the lifeboat did him no good, did it? There is talk instead of a lifeboat from the people on the ship about a God that might could save them from their perils. And they cast lots to see who was at blame for this peril because we want to blame people for the troubles out there. And the lots cast, cast fell upon Jonah. He knew he had done wrong. He knew that he had sinned. And God uses, uses even this situation to proclaim His glory so that the people from the ship, people from all over the world would go back and proclaim His glory. And He provided a lifeboat, not necessarily the kind of lifeboat that I would want to stay in the belly of a fish for three days. Wow. There is a God that can save. There is a God who loves every single human being enough to create them, knowing that they would rebel against Him and knowing that He would have to, to pour out His wrath by taking His sons, by His Son offering up His life to save yours. That's a pretty awesome God who can save, who can do whatever He needs to do. Jesus did His part. Do you believe His words? Do you trust Him? Do you follow after Him? Are there any other things that you're holding on to? Any other lifeboats that you need to get rid of? The problem is that too many people profess that they know the way, but don't follow the way. They profess Him with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him. Jesus told His disciples that He was going to prepare a place for them, and He told them they knew the way, but they said they didn't. John 14, 3 through 6, When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't know, the, no, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in verse 11 and 12, Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, even greater works. If that's not a verse that you have memorized or highlighted in your Bible, it should be. Because that didn't apply to just the 12, that applied to you and I. Greater things we will do, especially as a body of Christ, because when we go out of this uh, sanctuary, we go into different places and we're witnesses to different people all over. Jesus in flesh was at one place at one time, and we're at one place at one time, but there's 40 of us or however many there are. So are we living and proclaiming Jesus Christ and living a way that people see our times that we act, even in times of suffering, that we're obedient to Jesus so that they ask us of the hope that we have. So we don't get upset. We don't complain. We don't do this and that. But instead we praise God regardless of the situation that we're in. So here's the question. What do people see when they look at you in your life? Do they see God? I was somewhere. I'm trying to think where I was now. And people were going in. I don't remember where it was. Oh, I do now. It just hit me. It was to get on the plane to go out there. And this man couldn't get the barcode thing up, whatever you call it. I don't even know what it is. It's not a barcode. Whatever that little thing is to scan. I use a paper copy because I'm not going to get up there on the phone and mind rotating everything else. And his wife was cussing him from one end to the other. Weren't they going to get on that plane? Was someone else going to take their seat? They had a seat assigned. Why in the world would something that little 
upset you that much. Oh, there were people in the airport all upset because the day we flew out, there were storms in Atlanta, and there was a lot of people that missed their flights. There were a lot of upset people. Wouldn't that be a perfect time for you to be a witness, being calm and everything, and saying, oh, yes, I had these plans. I'm missing this, I'm missing that, but I know that God had something bigger in mind. Maybe it was talking to you right now. Isn't God in control? Doesn't He love you? Won't He provide the things you need? Why do you worry about them then? Instead, praise Him. Be His ambassador in this world. Jonah ran. The storm came. Others watched and cried out. God revealed Himself even though Jonah didn't. And there were lives saved on that ship. And I'm not talking physically. I'm talking spiritually for all eternity. I wonder what they thought if they saw the fish swallow Jonah. <laughs> We've talked about this before, what he looked like when he was vomited up on the coast. It had to have a bearing in the people's decision because even the king took off his royal robes and sat in ashes where we belong at the feet of Jesus because what he's done for us. No one deserves grace, but it's freely offered to anyone who is willing to take it. In the belly of the fish, there was plenty of time to think and pray, wasn't there? The trip was not going as planned. You know the rest. This is not a sermon about Jonah. You know his heart still wasn't exactly right by any means. But let's go to Paul's fishing trip. We're supposed to fish for men, and we've seen that all throughout Acts, how he has fished for men, how controversies, how beatings, how things have not hindered him, and maybe how he even tried to take the bull by the horns a little bit and jump God's planning and go into Jerusalem. Maybe not. That's all speculative. Don't let me put thoughts out there that aren't. But before we get started on chapter 25, which you should have read this week, then let's turn back to Acts chapter 9 at Paul's conversion. This is what the Lord said. Verse 15. He says this to Ananias because Ananias doesn't want to, to be a part of Saul because he is just trying to destroy the church. And the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings. I sp specify that because we're going to see that happen, and there was no reason for that to happen except God said that would happen, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, now, I want you to do this. I want you to put in your name. Alan is my chosen instrument. Yes, I am. I was called out of the darkness into the light if I would listen and follow, if I'd have the faith to walk this world, to deny myself and the things that I care about, my will and everything else. doesn't mean I still can't have things in this world. doesn't mean I don't live in a land of freedom and of plenty and everything, but it means what I have, I am rich so that I can be rich to others. I have freedom to tell the gospel message, so I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. Imagine that. I am His chosen instrument to take my message to whoever that is might be. In Paul's case, it would be even to kings. It would be the Gentiles because they would be more reci recipient of God's Word, and it would be to the people of Israel who would continually try to kill him. And I will show, how show him how much he must suffer for my namesake, and I will show Alan how much he must suffer for my namesake. If you talk to me much, you know that's something I struggle with. Because suffering does bring about things that help build your character, perseverance, everything else. Scripture tells us that. But I don't feel like I've ever suffered. I didn't suffer on this trip. I won't call this suffering. I will call this, like I said, a trip I did not plan exactly the way I planned. <laughs> more costly than I planned, more time-consuming than I, than I planned. But by the grace of God, I'm home. I've got my grandchildren. Life is good. Why do we worry about the things? Maybe I was a light to the people that were there. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I professed and, and did. I, I behaved the way that I should instead of not. I did do that much. But that took being tied into the Spirit and everything so that I wouldn't complain, so I wouldn't mumble and groan. When we left out at the ch end of chapter 24, Paul has been left into pr prison for two years, just abandoned, forgotten about. Why was he left there? Because Felix wanted to please the people. That's what most people want. And he wanted money. He wanted to bribe from Paul. 
So Paul sat there two years in jail. He didn't write epistles from there or anything that we know of. He may have. We don't know what he did from there. But he sat there for two years. Why? How is that in God's will? How is that in His plans? Certainly not in my plans. We don't have anything to say about how it was like with the Philippian jailer or anything else. It's just kind of a forgotten part. And then Felix comes in. The new governor. I stress governor because there's a king coming up in a second. Felix would not listen to the Holy Spirit. Instead, he heard Paul's message, but he didn't want to give up his authority, his power and everything. And he calls the king in, and I think I said Felix, but I meant Festus. He calls the king in to examine also. Why? If you take a minute to study and everything, there was no reason to. He had the authority and everything. He could have done everything he did. Paul already made his appeal to Caesar. Paul is going to go to Caesar. That's the law. Why was the king brought in? Because Jesus said, you will be my witness to kings. You can trust everything that Jesus said. Jesus said he would be beside of, that he, beside of him and that he would go to Rome. In Acts chapter 25, verses 6 to 11, it was about eight or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea, and on the following day he took his seat in court in order that Paul be brought in. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. Paul denied the charges. I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government, he said. Then Festus wanted to please the Jews, asking him, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before there, for me there? But Paul replied, No, this is official Roman court, so I ought to be tried here. You know very well I am not guilty of harming the Jews. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I am innocent, no one has a right to turn me over to these men to, to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Dropping down to verse 13. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice. This was just happenstance, right? No, it was God's planning. To pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. We plan our steps, we plan our trips, but it is God who sets our course. It is Him who puts the wind in our sails, and hopefully that's the Holy Spirit who is guiding you through each and every day so that you walk by the, in step with the Spirit regardless of the circumstances. Paul would be a witness to kings. We plan our steps. Yep, there's nothing wrong with that. We plan them. But just remember, you're only a co-pilot. Verse 17 through 19, When his accusers came, came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and order Paul brought in, but the accusations made against him weren't any of the crimes I expected. Instead, it was something about their religion and a dead man named Jesus who Paul insists is alive. Is that your testimony? Is that why you act the way you do and live the way that you do? The Holy Spirit will speak to the king also, but the king will decide he's not going to repent and take off his royal robe and sit in ashes. But he does listen, Acts 25, 22. I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said. Many hear the words of God. They hear the words of Jesus, but they go in one ear and out the other. Or they profess, but their hearts are far from him. But a few will deny themselves take up their cross and follow after Jesus. That's where when you have these quotes, Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple. He doesn't say if anyone wants to be saved. He doesn't say if anyone wants to be a believer. If you believe you are saved, you are ju justified, sanctified, made holy, set apart, and you believe that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords and you pledge your allegiance to Him, you deny yourself Take up your cross and follow after Jesus. It's the proof of the pudding, so to speak, what James wrote about. Chapter 26, verse 1, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You may speak in your defense. The word there is apologemia. I butchered it a little bit. You might understand another word, apologia. Oh, it, you read it this morning, Merle. You didn't realize it necessarily, but you read it. It's the defense we give, the reason that we give, for the hope that we have. Because we live in such a way that it's countercultural. You live as a Jesus freak, so to speak, whatever the words you want to put is, so that people see that and you give your legal defense, so to speak, your reason for hope. So Paul was giving his defense today. 
And today I had you read your scripture from 1 Peter chapter 3. Ironically, that's what you're going to read today. Right? You're going to be going through Peter and reading that, how to defend your faith. Instead of complaining because you suffer, instead of trying to get your rights wrong, instead of seeking vengeance, instead of whatever things that naturally, humanly, fleshly come about, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. A little different than the NIV. Worship Christ. Christ how? As Lord of what? Your life. And then if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Apologia. Not just hope that you profess, but hope that you live in all circumstances regardless of the trouble at sea. So Paul does give his apologia to kings, but would they listen? Acts chapter 26, verses 6 and 7. Now I'm on trial because of my hope, just like Peter wrote, in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the twelve tribes of Israel zealously, zealously worship God night and day, and they share the same hope I have. Yet, Your Majesty, they accuse me for having this hope. Because his hope is founded on a man named Jesus who died and is alive. Verse 9, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. And as a result, he destroyed many believers, many disciples, and now he is building churches and training up disciples. So that they, what does the Great Commission say? So that they are obedient to Jesus' commands. Verse 12, one day I was on such a mission to Damascus. I was going along just as I had planned. I wasn't worried about any troubles at sea. And then all of a sudden Jesus entered my life and turned uh, everything upside down. And now here I am, because Jesus said I would, talking to you, O King. Wow. God is in complete control. Might not go exactly like we want it to. Verse 18, Paul is preaching this message so that to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. To open your eyes so that you can see because you're blind before. You think things are this way. You think these things are important. You think you have control of things. But you're under the power of Satan, Scripture says, rather than the power of God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. It's by faith that we're saved. It's by faith that we live. By faith we take every step because we don't know what tomorrow, even the next second, will hold. Verse 20, All must repent, even kings. These are the words of the king. They must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. Will you hear this, King? Will you hear this, Alan? Will you hear this, everyone else? Will you hear Jesus' words and change? Verse 24, suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you're insane! Too much study has made you crazy. That's why the world might call you a Jesus freak. They might say that you have lost it. But if you've got a hold of Jesus as your lifeboat, your only lifeboat, then don't worry about what the world says around you because they're all out in the sea still. Chapter 27. Oh, chapter 26 at the end. The only thing that the governor and the king could agree on was this, verse 32. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Boy, they missed the whole point, didn't they? It's not about this world and its system of kings and kingdoms. It's, it's about the king of all kings and the lord of all lords. Chapter 27, the keep, trip keeps going, but things are getting off course <laughs> pretty bad, right? Or at least off course of what I think, right? Paul sets out for Rome, but, he, but he's in chains. Who would have ever seen that coming? Hurricane season was coming, so it made no sense to even leave yet. And in Acts chapter 27, verse 4, putting out to sea from there, we encountered strong headwinds. It made it difficult to keep the ship on course. So we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. Down to verse 7, we had several days of slow sailing, and after great difficulty, we finally neared Snidus. But the wind was against us, so we sailed across to Crete, 
and along the sheltered coast of the island past the Cape of Salam Salmon. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty and finally arrived at Fair Havens. But don't let the name fool you because Fair Havens wasn't a good place to spend the winter. So let's think. Let's do our own judgment. Let's reason. But don't we need to put God into this mix? If we sail 40 more miles, that's it. On this same piece of land, there is a safe place we can harbor. Makes sense, right? 40 miles. Okay, well, let's read on. Verse 10. Men, this is Paul, he said, I believe there is a trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. Boy, he hits a nail on the money, don't he? But this is not necessarily a spiritual revelation. This is just his common sense based on the time of year that it is. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. Okay? And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only southwest and northwest exposure. Makes sense, right? We set our footsteps, we plan out. Oh man, did I hear when I got back from Sherry, I told you so. <laughs> That's not necessarily helpful, guys, as far as Christian uh, support, okay? But boy, I heard that I told you something would happen on this trip. <laughs> it made sense. The, the ship's commander made sense to them, it made sense to everyone else, but was anybody consulting God in all this? Because we plan out our steps. Each and every day you get up, I hope you pray first, maybe read God's Word first, but you plan what you planned on doing that day till something comes along and drastically changes it. And then how will you live and behave and who will you profess as in control of your life and will you give Him honor and praise? Acts chapter 27, verse 13. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. Let's go. Makes sense. They pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete, but the weather changed abruptly. They're sh sailing along the coastline. They'll be fine. Land's in sight. And a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out of sea. They couldn't see land anymore. Oh, whoops. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Kadia, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Did you catch that part? The ship didn't have a way to really carry the lifeboat, so they towed it behind them, because guess what? We do not want to go out to sea without a lifeboat, do we? It just makes sense. But this lifeboat was dragging them down in the storm. It wasn't saving them. It could potentially sink them. But they still need it because it's their lifeboat. So they ho hoist it aboard. It's a good thing to have lifeboats. Man, if not, we might have to have a great fish come and swallow us. Okay. Jesus is our only lifeboat. I hope and pray you got that out of this, that he's in control, that he told Paul exactly what would happen, and this is exactly what happened, and Jesus had another set of people in mind that still needed to hear the gospel message that Paul would have probably missed in his own wisdom. The storm got worse and worse until all hope was lost, but not for Paul, right? He continued to be an example. Is all hope really ever lost for a child of God? Maybe you remember that the next time that the storms get really rough because it's never, ever lost. So what if you die? You spend eternity with Jesus. Wow. Acts chapter 27, verse 21. Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. I don't know how he said that, but I can kind of figure he's got an attitude. And like I said, this is not necessarily from prophecy. There is nothing in the, the text that tells us that. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even the ship, even though the ship will go down. Before he said it might. For last night an angel of God, to whom I belong and to whom I serve, stood beside me. Just like Jesus stood beside him in prison before, now one of God's messengers is coming and delivering the word of God and standing beside of him. We're never alone. And he said, this is prophecy, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in His goodness 
has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. You don't think that at the time. You don't think this is good when you're being tossed to and from. The ship is breaking apart, as Luke said. They had to tie ropes around the ship because it's literally breaking apart. You don't think things are good. But if you know God is watching over you and you know that He will protect you if it's in His wills, then all is good. It is well with my soul. Look at what that song is written about if you have time. And everyone sailing with him would be safe. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. God's grace is so amazing. And he wants to save us not from the toils and troubles of this fallen world that we're in, but he wants us to be in a new creation with him forever. His grace and love does not say to us that we won't encounter storms or even shipwrecks but that Jesus will be our lifeboat. Not Jesus plus, but Jesus. And Jesus will carry us through the storm, through the shipwreck, and all the way to eternity. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe this? Do you know the way that I am going and preparing a place for you? The storm rages on, and the men sense land, and they check in their own own thought process again, which is fine, and they see that they're close to shore and they think they can make it. It just makes sense. Verse 30, Then the sailors try to abandon the ship. They lower the lifeboat uh, as though they were going to... Uh, as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, You will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. Uh, there's where I had to sit down. <laughs> I think I was already sitting, but that's okay. <laughs> and think, would I do that? I mean, Paul was a good testimony and everything. And I didn't see this angel. I didn't see Jesus stand beside me. I didn't see him on the road to Damascus. Cut the lifeboat and let it drift away. Would I have the faith to do that? And we're talking all the men on the ship, slaves, uh, sailors, captains, comrades. Luke was there. It says we in this part of the passage. Luke was there with Paul. Wow, what a step of faith for Paul to say this. And the men did that. And every one of them were saved. Would you have the faith to do that? So let's take faith, this faith trip even further that we've gone on. You haven't eaten in two weeks if you read the passage. Paul sits down and sells them to eat, spends some fellowship and time in prayer, and then says, throw all the food overboard too. Boy, that's relying on daily bread, isn't it? Okay, well, we trust God. We're going to get shipped back on an island, but what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Don't worry about these things. That's what the thoughts are dominated on by the people of the flesh. Instead, live by the Spirit, have faith in God. Verse 38, After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. Verse 32, The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. I, wonder, I bet if they even tried, would they, their arrows even hurt them or their daggers even hurt them? Because God said everyone would, would come to safety. It made sense to kill the prisoners. They're only prisoners. They don't have any right to live, and what would we feed them or anything anyway? But the commanding officer stepped up, wanting to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Oh, yeah, because Paul was a prisoner. Don't forget that. He was in chains. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump over, overboard first and make for the land. The others held on to planks or, or debris from the fro broken ship, so everyone escaped safe, safely to shore. Everyone was saved. God is in complete control over the winds and the waves, everything else. You have the ability to believe and trust in Him and let it be seen by your actions or not. A new day dawned, but they did not recognize the land. They did not know what perils were waiting for them there. Would they continue to walk by faith rather than sight by human reasoning? Chapter 28, verse 1, Once they were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a, fi a, a fire on the shore to welcome us. Woo! We're on dry ground now. All is good. What happens next? 
a poisonous snake comes out and bites Paul. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Could this story get any more crazy? The natives thought that Paul must have been a murderer. And then when he didn't puff up and die, they said he must be a god. Paul said, no. Let me tell you about Jesus. Wow. Wow. And as we read on in Acts chapter 28, verse 10, as a result, they were showered with honors. When the time came to sell, the people supplied us with everything we needed for our trip. All the grain, all the clothes, what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, God supplied it all, didn't He? Even a new ship to carry us. And now we don't need a lifeboat as much, do we? Because we know our lifeboat is grounded in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Just think of the stories they went on to tell, the churches that they began to, by their uh, testimony, set up here and there. Will you walk by faith, not by sight? Will your actions show it? Who would have ever seen this coming? I don't know that even Paul had this big of an idea of how God worked. Luke goes on to write about the journey that he has in his trip to Rome. And when he gets to Rome, there's no one really there to accuse him, is there? So for two more years, all right, so we got two years, we got this journey at sea, and we got and the shipwreck, and on the island, and we got two more years, almost five years. Paul is a prisoner in chains, but look at the people that he professes Jesus Christ to and the lives that are truly saved for all eternity. I don't think Paul ever had his trip planned that way. Maybe he even jumped the gun, not saying he did. But God is in complete control, and people came face to face with Jesus Christ. Some believed, some didn't. But the ones that did were saved for all of eternity. And we're reading some of, we'll be reading more, some of the letters that Paul did write when he was in custody at Rome. The roar that we're reading today is a result of Paul's great tribulation that he went through. And the words that he wrote for the church for an even greater tribulation that they would go through when they would be burned alive. Will you walk by faith rather than sight? Will you trust in Jesus Christ alone? Oh yeah. Are there any lifeboats that you should cut loose? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the grace upon grace upon grace that you bestow every single day of our lives. That you are a God worthy of praise and that we don't give it near enough. We can never give it enough. That there are no works of righteousness that we can ever give. But we can give you all that we are. We can love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. We can on our own, but we can with your Spirit, Lord, as we, as we let the Spirit guide us, as we read your Word, as we're filled through and through to be more and more like Christ. Increase our faith. Help us to believe even when the times look so dismal. Help us not to get complacent in the, in the times are so good. Father, thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country, help us to use them for you. Thank you for the riches that we have, Lord. Help us to be rich to others. Father, help us to not forget to when we sit down, when we get up, when we eat, when we go about our way, to tell our children, our friends, even our enemies, about the grace that you have given to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to walk together as a church into the kingdom of heaven when we meet Jesus face to face. We thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.